Hi there. It's Marcus again. No surprises there. Um, I'm here to talk to you about morality and textuality, which is, for me, one of the most interesting aspects of our course. It's interesting because it speaks to the heart of the way the Western world sees, experiences reality. Um, and I was thinking about it. I've just come in. I'm a bit sweaty. I was mowing the lawn. I was thinking about it because of this guy, J.S. Bach, and the fact that I play a lot of classical music, all right? But I've always played it. I, I've always set out to read the music and memorise it so I can play it as I'm feeling. So what I'm doing is I'm ingesting um, music, written dot, black dot music, and I am running it through my whole visceral nervous system and everything, and then I'm giving it back. People who memorise poetry and, you know, you know, thespians, the people who do, you know, plays and so on, do the same thing. You take in a text, you're bound, as a historian is bound, by what is there, by what is given, by the evidence, the facts or whatever we might want to call that the events a la Lutex, and we give it back. So if you're a Shakespearean actor, to be or not to be, alas, poor Eric, I knew him well, both of them from Hamlet, right? Um, but or whether I'm, I, I particularly, because I used to teach, I used to learn a lot of uh, the quirky sorts of poems. Uh, the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. OK, uh, so I, I used to learn stuff like that. Sometimes I've also learned things, the beautiful mystical poetry of Gerald Manley Hopkins or someone like that, who's a wonderful uh, 19th century Jesuit poet, uh, died quite young. Um, he, man, glory be to God for dappled things, but clouds of couple colour is a brinded cow. You know, um, or the glory of God shook uh, like shook foil, you know, and, and those sorts of things where you get rich metaphors and images, or you know, Rabindranath Tagore's poetry, which I also spent some time learning. I'm not sure if I can remember even a line of it just right now because really I wasn't expecting it was the music that set me off in this track. But the thing is, you internalize and you give back. For me, there's something similar to that process, but it's not the same as the process of Indigenous people internalising narrative, story, song line, song spiral, whatever we want to call it, in the Indigenous world. The thing is that ours is mediated by a certain kind of text. I've always felt that we have a way too narrow understanding of text. Perhaps it's because I have a huge amount of respect for um, people who just who are totally musically illiterate who can pick up and play the guitar way better than me. Doesn't detract from my love of the instrument, but I don't. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Or you know, a jazz musician who is able to improvise on a thing like you know, Jan Johansson, the wonderful Swedish jazz musician, or Jacques Lucier, who takes Bach, and with his, uh, it was a Jacques Lucier trio, he'd be dead by now for sure, this was like the 60s, 70s, 80s, who would then improvise on a piece of Bach. There, there's more of this happening now in the classical music world where people are feeling, you know, there's not enough oxygen really. How many different ways can you play a piece of Bach if you're going to play the black dots? Okay, so... For them, they're exploring orality, orality, not orality, okay? But it's very, very similar. There is some kind of restlessness emerging in amongst historians. The, the number of historians I was wanting to pull in, and I've been very selective uh, for this lecture, to pull in just a few and, of course, to stay true to the readings uh, as well, but for me, there is something very special going on. And what it is, is that possibly it's after the, what well, you know, in philosophy, we talk about the various turns. So one of them is the textual turn, which was led by Derrida and people like that, who questioned 
the uh, discursive nature of text. That's really important to think about. And from there, 30 or 40 years ago, we've ended up now with the linguistic turn and so on. And now I think we're having, if you want to come up with another turn, we would have to say the um, the orality turn or something like that, where textuality itself is being stretched. The concept of the text itself is being stretched so that a text is like your DNA or it's like um, for the Indigenous people, the archive, their, their archive, as in Songline's book, this one here, oops, oops, okay, as in this wonderful image which I use again in this week's lecture just for fun. Um, and it's about the human relationship to memory and meaning and so on. And, of course, the historian has a very intimate relationship with memory and meaning and how the world is structured by those people we are seeking to represent or access, those people from the past. And if, for me, it's also those people in the future, because I think there are plenty of ways of accessing aspects of the future. The future doesn't exist yet, but it is out there. The past no longer exists. Well, you can't go back any longer and interview James Cook or anybody like that. Or Ned Kelly, Ned, why did you go and shoot those three guys? He's not going to tell you because he's dead. And nobody else can tell you. We have to look at elements like the, the coral reef that's left behind some elements of text, you know, the various, the trial um, records and so on. We don't, I don't think, no, I mean, someone stole his head or his skull or whatever it was. I, I don't know if we've got any DNA remnants of Ned Kelly or his brothers, maybe we can get them through, you know, a family lineage and that's related to the Kellys, but to find out whether he was criminally insane or delusional or something like that, or suffered from bipolar and, you know, was therefore prone to criminality. Not that I'm saying some of us are bipolar. One of my you know, sons is bipolar. So I'm not, I'm not cutting aspersions on bipolar. I'm just pulling it out of the air. And to say that there might be other dimensions to the realities that these people inhabited. So that's really important. So let's leap into this. Um, and we're looking at orality and textuality. So here's the two-headed face of, of the so-called god Janus. The uh, Janus is, uh, orality like Janus has two faces, okay? And, and the, sorry, the two-faced god should be not good <laughs> of Western antiquity, slap. Okay, I should have checked my slides, um, but that showed that I'm human, right? So orality is like Janus. It has two faces. One face is the personal and the subjective. Okay, this is the face particularly that people like Portelli are reading uh, number two uh, are looking for. The other face is the collective living source of knowledge, which I'm calling the non-Western, okay? Um, you know, I could have called it the Indigenous, but there are so many different forms of this collective and living memory. Uh, but, of course, we're going to focus on Indigenous Australian memory uh, because it is so beautifully described in a number of... So I really like the, the way Portelli writes. So he writes very well. It's an old writing reading, actually. It was um, first written up in 1976, and it was reprinted in the Oral History Reader in 2006. Okay, And he says, look, there seems to be fear that once the floodgates of orality are opened, writing and rationality, which I've bolded and deliberately underlined along with it, will be swept out as if by a spontaneous, uncontrollable mass of fluid amorphous material. In other words, orality is difficult for a, you know an historian who's only ever read text. And now I'm thinking again, holding up my bar of the many classical uh, musicians that I know who are superb musicians, but you ask them to play something from memory or say, can you improvise? And immediately they go into a cold sweat. All right, it's the same thing for historians. So, but this attitude, the attitude of fear, blinds us historians to the fact that our awe of writing, oh, writing, oh, that person writes beautifully. Which I, I mean, I have to say, I'm guilty of that. I, when I read Tom Griffiths or somebody, I, I'm just saying, this is just such wonderful, wonderful uh, prose. It's distorted our perception of language and communication to the point where we no longer understand either orality or the nature of writing itself. 
of course, I'm writing what I'm thinking, the words are in my head, I'm going from oral into text. And once the text is there, of course, especially once it's printed, it's there for perpetuity or, you know, in, in terms of my life. But we know that many uh, texts will dis and do disappear very quickly. Um, so, uh, had this sort of similar language and communication to the point where we no longer understand either orality or text or writing, okay? As a matter of fact, written and oral sources are not mutually exclusive. Is that a surprise to you? I'm not sure when it was a surprise to me. Maybe it was never a surprise to me. It makes perfect sense. I mean, the, the thing is, both of them are using language. Both of them work together to create meaning, create context. Many of much of the time, unless it's a shopping list or something, it tells a, a clear narrative sort of story and so on. They have common as well as autonomous characteristics and specific functions which only either one can fill. Okay, or which one set of uh, sources feels better than another. Okay, therefore they require different specific interpretive instruments. Now, when I was thinking about that, and I haven't used this book, you know, I went and grabbed this book, uh, Primitive Rebels by Eric Hobsbawm, thinking, I wonder if there's oral stuff in here. But of course, most of these people were, you know, at the beginning of the 19th century. So we've got textual representations of speeches given and so on. Uh, and you can feel that Hobsbawm, as a young historian as he was here, is feeling his way into how do I represent people who didn't have control over the representation of themselves through text because it was the elites that were writing the texts at that time. And that poses a very interesting problem for the historian. It's the sort of problem that Barbara Tuckman is talking to in that earlier reading. Okay, but that sits there waiting like a ticking time bomb for, for me to uh, turn to and find exactly what I need, but it's not for this particular uh, lecture. So, you know, they do something special. Each does its own thing, but the spectre, and I really like that image uh, of orality, uh, which is the, I think it's the first line of the reading that uh, Portelli um, sounds out with this great image of the spectre of orality. So here we would have a spectre floating around in a graveyard, right? The graveyard, each one of those has words on it, those gravestones, right? You know, here lies Marcus, you know, he wasn't a bad bloke and, you know, and that sort of thing. That is text. Once it's in stone, following the metaphor, it stays in stone. Okay, here's my good friend Nas Rudin, uh, taken from a uh, cartoon book of his stories. That which is in the light. If I, and I don't know where it is, I have a number of old books lying around somewhere buried in one of my other bookshelves, not in this room, on Sufi stories, teaching stories, where you have somebody doing something ridiculous in order to illustrate a lesson, a life lesson. So the story that I remember probably most clearly of Nasrudin's is that, you know, there he is outside his house looking around in the gardens, rummaging through everywhere. And a friendly neighbour comes up and says, Nasrudin, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. Oh, I'll help you. And the guy goes in and, you know, they're looking for keys for everywhere in the, in the lawn and in the shrubs and everything. Eventually, they, it, the keys aren't anywhere to be found. And the chap turns to Nasruddin and he says, Nasruddin, where did you leave them? Oh, they're inside. But why are we looking out here? He says to Nasruddin, oh, because there's more light out here. So the, the lesson is the punchline. Um, but the point is, is that if we only turn to text, which is like light, it's something that you can hold in your hand, you can say, yes, I've got it. You can go to an archive and pull it out. Even the most ancient of texts, and I've got an image showing uh, cuneiform quite soon. You know, these texts, uh, they tell just part of the story. And they might not even be telling you the, uh, the story that you're after in any way at all. But, you know, you at least have them. So rationality is understood. I'm building off the, the underlined word from the previous slide. It's understood as something explicit and tangible. But is it really? This is my question. So Portelli is suggesting 
and certainly Indigenous people see it this way, that rationality is internally coherent and fluid. It is alive. In the oral traditions, rationality is alive to new readings, but also to new meanings, right? This is really important. Rationality leads us somewhere. It tends to be rather linear unless you hit it with something and, and you know, uh, which is what oral traditions can really do. They can help us. But at the same time, we're still applying the same rational logic. Why? Because textuality has made our minds linear. Okay, which I'd like you to think about. So the history is in search of authentic representation of experience, action, and also motive. But it also, remembering Herodotus, a historian is after understanding of this of whatever the period might be, or the context of the situation or the event. For indigenous people, continuity and identity come in very strongly there. Ah, there it is. Okay, so before we turn to song lines, I'm just touching on some work from Patrick Nunn, who's a fantastic writer and thinker and academic, and of course he worked at USC. Some of you may already have had him at your memory. All right, this is one of his books. And now Patrick is a very interesting human geographer, and he looking at memory and amnesia. And he's talking about them quite extensively at the beginning of that book on the edge of memory, because he points out that literacy often confers arrogance and an uncritical faith in the superiority of the written word over the spoken word. So just think about it this way. Last week, we looked at how to read the New Testament to try and understand what it might have been that Jesus said, as opposed to what it was that people put into his mouth. Now, don't be so shocked that people were putting things into Jesus' mouth, because as Christianity developed, certain schools, faith groups, and so on, took it in various directions. There was a major contestation around Christianity in its first three to four centuries, there were what were called many her heresies um, and so on, the Pelagian heresy um, and so on. So, and each one of these, in order to make their cases, created books. Some of them ended up as the Gospels. Now, the Gospels are quite different. If you go off and read the, I'm looking around here for it, I lost amongst all my books. If you go off and have a look at how Jesus was made God by Bart Ehrman, you'll discover that he provides a really interesting lineage of the various gospels, the various contestations around what Christianity ends up being. It's really, really interesting and it's quite profound. It shouldn't shake your faith it, because faith stands outside of historical context faith is something that uh, springs from an inner um, sense of connection to a meaning system all right so i'm uh, you know i'm uh, really interested in early christianity because christianity lies at the heart of our culture our morals and ethics values and so on even if you've never walked inside a church and even if you've never seen a bible but the bible is like Homeric um, Iliad and Odyssey. It's something that was an oral tradition that at different times across its long emergence as the Bible um, met orality, have no textuality, sorry, like this cuneiform here, uh, and it was nailed down. And once something gets nailed down, it's then uh, the changes it's, sort of experiences over millennia, you could say, or centuries at least, um, is often to do with scribal error or theological persuasions that, as you know, a scribe is, you know, writing this out, some monk in, you know, 11th century, and, you know, they're under the influence of a certain understanding of, you know, uh, an event in the Bible, and they might add three or four words or a, a line or two, and what's his name? Um, Bart Ehrman is really good at identifying these he doesn't always identify them himself but he'll turn to some scholar who has done so to point out hey look at this there's inconsistencies in the book of isaiah an old testament book um and we can see bah, 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 bah. or hey look we've got two gospels here and they obviously drawing on another source but we don't have the source let's call it q because you know we we we're questioning where it, where it is we do not have it yet perhaps the source will be found in another jar 
in the um, Negev Desert or somewhere like that um, and become another Dead Sea Scroll. That would be cool, but, you know, we just don't know. And at the moment, you know, scholars are doing that sort of work. Patrick, in order to illustrate, Patrick Nunn, uh, in order to illustrate uh, the uh, case he's making for orality and its importance in uh, historical and geographical research, uses the um, story of Mount Mazama, okay, which no longer exists. It's actually a big hole, but it was an active volcano, which around 7,600 years ago went bang, and it is now a lake, a crater lake, okay? But the story comes down through indigenous uh, Amer Amerindian um, memory, okay, all the way down to today. And it was recorded in first, I think he says, in the 1890s or something like that. So this is why he's made, and he made, you know, the last 10 years at least of his life have been researching these stories. He's appeared in the conversation a number of times, had the conversation being the uh, uh, fantastic sort of summary of insights talking about orality and early climate change or, you know, sea level rise and, 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 uh, and change of, of, you know, environments and so on that goes back 9 10 11 12000 years it's very very interesting stuff but you have to know what you're doing there is a discipline to it there is a science to it okay it's not just you know grabbing Hansel and Gretel and making some story about it uh it actually needs to be evidenced evidence will always be the backbone of historical work Okay, doesn't matter if it's orality or the other. So from Patrick, two quotes. History celebrates memorable events and shuns the mundane. Well, so does memory, the memory of the great flood. It appears in Gilgamesh and, and in the very early epics. It appears in most uh, early stories somewhere at some point. It's really important to understand that there was probably some flood. And, you know, it's it, there are many ways of taking that. I'm not going to go any further. But, you know, it, people aren't going to remember, remember, oh, my mum was making me a sandwich the other day, you know, and, and turn that into some memory. It's got to link to some kind of lesson or some warning, as in the Mazama, uh, Mount Mazama warning and so on. So he says, it is in our nature to do this, to wish to have our minds stimulated and our imaginations unleashed, okay, with some great story of some kind, rather than to be compelled to focus on the predictable everyday happenings. All right, and he goes on a few pages later, we have become dependent on writing and reading. And I've been looking everywhere and I couldn't find it. Oh, shush phone. Uh, I couldn't find it. Uh, this great uh, quote from Umberto Eco. I had an essay oh, 20 or 30 years ago, at least, in some book that must be lost now. I sent it to someone where he says, look, uh, our memories are dying uh, because of text. Oh, I'm gonna, I can't turn that off, actually, because I'm hotspotting from it. Um, so we'll have to put up with the bings when they come in. So he says, we've become dependent on reading and writing, or writing and reading, dependent on the written word, and in the process have invariably convinced ourselves that the, this is better, that what we're dependent on is better, must be superior to the spoken word. But he says, but it was not always so. I think that's really important to have, you know, a solid scholar like Patrick Nunn saying something like that. So let's keep moving then. So going back to Paul Telly, the first thing that makes oral history different, therefore, he tells us, is that it tells us less about events and more about meaning, hence my terrific little uh, image there. What's the meaning of life? Stop searching and you won't find it in a book. Remember that. You might find a lot of wonderful things in a book, but you're not going to find the meaning of life. So it's less interested, oral history is less interested in events and more interested in meaning. That links up very much with the Indigenous, okay? So um, Margot Neal, wave this book again, okay, like that. Songlines, you know, she says, uh, she cites Dempsey, who's an Indigenous Australian man. She says, look, the trouble with what is that we keep our, no, I'm talking about myself now, our brains in books. And, you know, she then refers to <clears throat> another uh, indigenous person who said look we have white soil which is that very thin powdery dust on the top of our continental history and then we have black soil which is deep like these images here from my um, you know um indigenous cave art and you know it's really really important to understand that we've we're superimposing 
an eternal present. Whites have always been here, our society, our civilization, Australian white civilization, Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-European or whatever we want to call it, modernist civilization, is what is real. But that reality is just skin deep. We just scratch the surface and we will end up um, finding a, a deep, deep, rich history. So this brings us to the question of the archive. Now, we normally associate the archive with going off to the library or to the museum and going through old records of one kind or another. But the archive for Indigenous Australians is quite different, all right? So from our reading, you know, many Aboriginal families, particularly those like mine, she says, who were deeply affected by colonisation, had long interrogated both the Western archive, okay, that's the archive I was just describing, and what remained of our Indigenous master archive to retrieve what could, uh, uh, what we could of our stolen past. So I've got this image of Sherberg here, which is, you know, our lo local um detention camp really it was uh, during the period of um, stolen generation it was a very unpleasant place to be we now have um, reclaimed in a sense some of the distress whites have modern white uh, civilization australian civilization in order to uh, understand what it meant to be taken from your family, incarcerated in Sherbrooke, or the whole family was taken and put there as well. <sighs> Sorry. But so there's this Indigenous master archive. But that's not the written word. It's not text. It's an oral history associated, as that book Song Lines is seeking to demonstrate, with deep time. All right? And so she goes on, it's this capacity of Aboriginal people to adapt to change that has enabled their survival for millennia. Now we're talking about probably the most, um, what's the word, traumatic experiences a, a culture can have, being totally uh, overrun within a century, really, by a uh, white imperialist extractive culture it's quite quite an experience so if they can survive that and generate new ways of knowing as this book song lines might represent and and the series that's there plus also i'm looking around for where is it hiding the other book that I've, i'm actually citing in this thing here this terrific one song spirals and of course there are plenty of non-Aboriginal uh, uh, Indigenous ones from the US, from Canada, from South America, and from our beautiful stuff from Africa and so on, but we're staying within the Australian context, mainly because I just can't keep buying books <laughs> and, and discovering new things. But, you know, not true, really. There's a lot of stuff that I have uh, that could feed into that kind of work. So she's talking about the capacity of Aboriginal people to survive through adaptation what's adapt what are they doing here well these objects uh, written uh, and archival material are portals to places where the knowledge resides in country ultimately country is this this archive she's referring to and thus country can be accessed through them via song and performance even from a distance they are not about country no 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 not about the hills or the way Biwa and Tibra Garden were formed they are country, and the uh, Indigenous oral traditions around those fragmented, fractured, often captured only and to be removed, and you know, often through white rewritings of them, but not always the case, as is particularly true for the song spiral, which I am going to cite and quote for you in a moment. Okay, so what's interesting there is that Margot Neal and Lynn Kelly, who are authoring the Songlines book, their argument is that there is a third archive, and it's an archive in which Western archival thinking approach to the past and Indigenous Australian approach to the past through country is leading to a hybrid third archive. I think that is really, really interesting. So the thing about an oral tradition is that it is living, constantly adapting to its context. 
I've got a link there to Robin Wall Kimmerer, an American, North American uh, academic scholar. She's a botanist, but she's also a member of an Indigenous American tribe. Uh, they had their own stolen generation. So, uh, but she's written this beautiful book, Brain Sweetgrass, which is down there somewhere. Oh, it's a delight. But this is a an interview she's done uh, with uh, Krista Tippett for a book, uh, you no know, podcast which is just it's just wonderful it's about an hour long so probably only for you know the those of you who are really curious you just save it for a rainy day and she she's talking about uh the way the land has a voice essentially so here we've got from this book now and then and it's not authored by an individual or a set of individuals it's authored by the gay group of a gay woo group of women all right, and they say who they are. They define their fam familial and clan relationships. And three of the women are non-indigenous in, in, in by birth, but you know they they working with these other women um, in order to generate the kind of thinking and insights that's in that book. So early on in the book, this is from the preface. That's why it's XV one or sixteen. They say, look, song spirals are often called song lines or song cycles. In this book. We call them song spirals as they spiral out and spiral in. They go up and go down, round and round forever. They are a line within a circle. They are infinite. They spiral, connecting and remaking. They twist and turn. They move and loop. This is like all our songs. Our songs are not straight lines. That's why I have trouble with timelines, for instance. They do not move in one direction through time and space. They are a map we follow through country, and they connect with other clans. Everything is connected, layered with beauty. And I just go, oh, mainly because my own experience of standing outside, thinking about and experiencing as I think uh, about it, the realities that, you know, Every aspect of who we are, material aspect of who we are, was laid down, you know, with the Big Bang and came out from there. But then we have consciousness, and that leads to culture, or cultures, plural. That means we have multiple pasts, multiple presents, and multiple futures. My present is not the same as an Afghani peasant's present, nor is it the same as African American's present or an Indigenous Australian's present. Each of us carries potential from the past which we're taking into the future and i think you know, we we need to think of that potential as beautiful whether it's the wound and i'm looking over here at the wounded storyteller which is a terrific book itself so where is it <laughs> it was there yesterday i must have pulled it out and moved it somewhere but the point really is is that there is so much happening in our world that is about renewal and regeneration and re scripting the narratives of the past and i think that's really important now i want to go back to inga clendenham as i nearly always do as you know i sort of fold across the readings this is a quote that i actually shared with you uh in i don't know week two or something where she says look historians take the large liberty of speaking for the dead but they take that liberty under the rule of the discipline remember method 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 discipline 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 we can't just make up history remember luke and the rule is strict if the people of the past are to be given a life beyond their own okay okay they need we need to do something historians must retrieve and represent the actualities of past experience that means physicalities here a, a jewish family is being rounded up uh, by uh, german troops nazi troops to be taken off to the death camps how do we represent people like that? How do we speak as white people, particularly for the stolen generation and the early crimes of, you know, white society against Indigenous Australians? This is the, the kind of moral and ethical dilemmas that historians face, and they are real, and we should be facing them every day. Okay, what kind of literacy are we talking about? The literacy of these women in their group or the song Long lines people you know is quite different from how we think about historical literacy traditionally. now tradition is great but we have to cherry pick it we have to turn to tradition and say that has enabled history to break free from mythology so that's good we can keep that but what is it exactly that helped us break free of myth ah we need evidence 
we need case studies. We need to test whatever assumption that we've got historically. And we need to keep that testing going on because, of course, from generation to generation, year to year, new evidence is appearing. It could be material evidence or it could be a new document or whatever it might be. That gives us further insight into whatever the historical problem is that we're facing. So Henrik, who's a guy that I actually used in History 140 now, but none of you or most of you, I don't think, are doing History 140. Where is he? Here he is. Great book. Okay. The Weirdest People in the World, and that's us. How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous is the subtitle. I like it. But what I like about him is that he's a psychologist as well as a historian. And he and he's been studying with his uh, research group in the US um, the impacts of let's say literacy upon Western society, social structure, and so on. He says, look, broad-based literacy, which really kicked in with the Protestant Reformation, where people started reading and we uh, you know and, and he, well, I'll keep, I'll be quiet. Broad based literacy changed people's brains and altered their cognitive abilities in domains related to memory, key to indigenous memory, uh, work that's been done with song spirals and song uh, lines and so on. Visual processing. We tend to read and focus. The Western mind has been trained to focus on, on words, okay? Visual processing, facial recognition, numerical exactness, and problem solving. It's made us linear. It's made us focused on the fact that a word can re a cow represents a cow. But how many different cows are there? What do you think of when you think of a cow? And so on. If, if, if you're not particularly illiterate in terms of agriculture, you might just have a general stereotype of a cow almost like a kid's cutout, whereas my wife and her family, they're all dairy farmers, and you know, they, they know the difference between all these blasted animals. I, I, I sort of say to my brother-in-law, what's that sort of cow? And, you know, sometimes now I can go, well, that's a wagyu, and that's a, you know, I, I've probably got about six or seven, eight, nine maybe even. And when I was in India, I visited the, uh, the cow ashram. And there they had cows the size of, you know, small dogs, all the way up to cows that towered above me almost. Yeah, they were huge, like an arrow or something. Um, so I'm very much aware that there are multiple cows in the world of many, many different kinds, all suited to certain kinds of environment or to certain kinds of economy. The hero food is made for McDonald's, you know, and it's all over the planet, which is a shocking thought. Okay, oops, what am I saying? Yes, so literacy itself has, and our obsession or our privileging of textuality over the spoken word has affected our brains. And it's led to us seeing the world in a way that allows us to analyse it particularly well. We analyse it, we pull the parts out, and we manipulate them, and you can end up breeding a different kind of cow. But we don't see the big picture. The kind of literacy that's been promoted by, you know, textuality means that we see the analytical, the, the increments of picture, but we can't necessarily see the big picture. Why? Because we have to associate to the big picture physically, like me, my story of me standing outside. I did it last night, actually, full moon last night. Um, and I looked up at the moon and it was like a sacred experience. Why? Because the moon invites me to connect with the bigger picture. Back to Portelli. And we're very close to the end now. But the unique and precious elements, he says, which oral sources focus upon, the uh, force, force upon, sorry, the historian, and which no other sources possess in equal measure is the speaker's subjectivity. Now, you've just gone and written your uh, first assessment on objectivity. But he's saying, look, the thing that's unique about oral histories, and he's talking about the Western now, is the subjectivity of the individual. What we have is a different interpretation of orality from our Indigenous friends and scholars. Okay, we've got to remember that. Theirs is collective, theirs is cultural, ours is more subjective. He goes on to say, if the approach to research is broad and articulated enough, a cross-section of the subjective subjectivity of a group or a class may emerge. He's moving closer and closer to a collective but he's still reaching each one through the subjective consciousness because, of course, while well, he was writing in the 1970s, um, 
um, the way he's constructing a reality is built, built around a sense of the power and importance of the individual versus or you know vis-a-vis -vis the collective consciousness of a group which is much more where indigenous mind indigenous worldview is situated and of course i'm simplifying it but that's sort of thing so he goes on to say oral sources tell us not just what people did but what they wanted to do and what they believed they were doing and what they know they now think they did that's really important uh, oral sources may not add much to what we know for instance about the material cost of a strike which of course we can go to the documents for that texts for that to the workers involved but they tell us a good deal about the psychological cost and i would say the motives as well so back to Lukacs from week three. Any slice of the past, you may remember this now, can be rendered in an account of fantasy, but no one would call that history. It's really important to understand that. And no one would call um, turning it around the work of these women as fantasy either. This is a cultural document. It's an attempt, a strong, powerful attempt to, to push orality and textuality closer together to wed the two and again that's the third archive at work because there are three white women working with them and each way if you if you read the introduction you'll find out that those three white men women are academics all right macquarie university and somewhere else i'm not sure i can't remember all right so this does not mean that the difference between the historian and the writer of fantasy is that between objective and subjective representation the historian and the fantasy artist's mental and imaginative capacities are of the same order. Okay, what are Tom Griffith and Inertia Lily Gwynn? I don't know if you know her, uh, but you know what you know two people are doing when they write fantasy or they write history. The conceptual work is of the same order. Both are in, in drawing out a world, a coherent world of meaning. Uh, in which individual motives and rationalities make sense within that bubble. Reading Tolkien's, you know, The Hobbit and, and you know, The Lord of the Rings, he wrote all that history behind it, which is now becoming, uh, it's coming out as a um, TV series, which I'm interested to see, to see how they do it. Because when I was a, a kid, I was obsessed with Tolkien. <laughs> so I actually read Tolkien before he died. So yeah, he's in some respects he saved my life because you know I was in a depressing school. It was horrible. So this tension between objective and subjective representation is going to be there. But the historian and the fantasy writers, the creative writers, the artists of imaginative capacity of the same order. So I like that. But the historian subject matter is limited by certain realities of the past. You can't make up the fact that Captain, or let, as he was then, Lieutenant James Cook, ran into Australia in, a, in, you know, in 1770. There's so much evidence around that that we uh, we are aware of it, and that we can't escape that. You can't have him deciding to come to Australia in 1670. Okay, it just doesn't work. <laughs> that's the end of the story um so yeah for me just to sum up you know in if i haven't yet convinced you um that orality is just as powerful just as evocative and performs specific functions not the same functions as textuality but parallel and that there are different kinds of literacy to be literate in a pretextual pre-writing world, a cuneiform world, for instance, where the majority of people didn't write, is quite different from being literate in an Indigenous world where the archive is actually the land. It's not a land outside. The land and human consciousness flow together. In a way, I think that we in the West cannot ever truly understand. Think about that, and thank you very much. See you again. Enjoy your, your break, by the way. <laughs>